Greetings once again from uh, Fresh Vision Church here in El Paso, Texas. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video or hear this message wherever you're at, whether it's at home here locally in El Paso or if it's just somewhere else. Truly, I'm sincere when I say that it means a lot that you've taken some time out of your day to, to check us out. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to share them on the bottom of, the, of this YouTube or Facebook video. And if you want to know more about us, you can go to our website at fvcelp.org, and there you'll find all the information about our church, a short little bio about myself, our guidelines for how we're doing church during the pandemic, um, a lot of other information on there. But if you have any questions that haven't been answered on the website, you can always contact me. Feel free to leave me a message, and um, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Also, your financial contributions are greatly appreciated, especially during this pandemic that we're going through. I've been praying for all of you this entire week, and, and one of my biggest prayers is that after you're done hearing this message, that the Lord would have spoken to you clearly and powerfully. If he has, please let us know. We'd like to hear all about it. Well, without further ado, I'll go ahead and begin with today's message. Today, we're going to be finishing off Luke chapter 17. And I've titled today's message, A Thankful and Prepared Heart. As we finish this chapter, we're going to be looking at two passages. In the first, we're going to be seeing how Jesus healed ten lepers. And in the second passage, we're going to be seeing him teach about his second coming. Now, when we covered the first ten verses of this chapter last week, we learned these truths about faith. Faith never tempts another person to sin. Faith forgives one who does sin. Faith asks God for miracles. And faith always sees oneself as a duty-bound slave. Well, this week, as we finish this chapter, the Lord will show us two other lessons, thankfulness and preparedness. So before we open up God's word, let's ask him to speak to us. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that you've given me the opportunity to share your word to those that are watching and listening. I pray that they will receive it with a soft heart and a soft mind. And may your word be implanted deep within those areas, Lord, so that it will grow into beautiful fruit. So use me to... to Scatter that seed properly, Lord. I pray that you will remove all distractions so that everyone's focus will be completely on you, Lord. Lord, we do pray for a heart of thankfulness and a heart of preparedness. So tell us what you want us to know, Lord. Because whatever it is that you want us to know, we know that it's for our own good. And even though it may be difficult at times, Lord, deep down inside we're thankful. So again, speak to us now. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned, we're going to be in Luke chapter 17, and we're going to be starting out in verse 11. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. And there, the word of God says, While traveling to Jerusalem, he passed between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he told them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And while they were going, they were cleansed. But one of them seeing that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice gave glory to God. He fell face down at his feet, thanking him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Or where are the nine? Did any return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he told them, get up and go on your way. Your faith has saved you. In case you don't know, the sin of unthankfulness is another peril 
in the life of the disciple or in the life of a follower of Christ. And this is illustrated in the story of the ten lepers. And for the third time in this gospel, Luke tells us that the Lord Jesus was traveling toward Jerusalem along the borders of Samaria and Galilee. The other two times were in Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 13. Now, Samaria was a land populated by people whom Jews considered half-breeds and were treated as though they were unworthy of God's blessings or their friendship. So any Jew entering any part of that land or encountering any Samaritans were considered unclean under Jewish law. Well, not bound by the religious rules made by men for their benefit. We learned that when Jesus entered a village in that area, 10 men with leprosy met him. Now, because they were aware of their diseased condition, they didn't come near to him, but instead they stood at a distance and cried out to him for mercy. When he saw them, he rewarded their faith, not with immediate healing, but by giving them a simple command, go and show yourselves to the priests. Now I wanna pause here for just a minute and mention something important. In Matthew chapter eight, we see that Jesus touched a leper and he was immediately healed. Here, however, he sends these lepers on a journey and they're healed eventually. Sometimes he spat in men's eyes and they could see instantly. Another time, a second touch was required for a blind man to see clearly. Well, the same is true today. Sometimes we pray for sick people and hear reports of wonderful healing. Other times, there's no sight of healing. In fact, sometimes things seem to get worse after we pray. Sometimes people who are faltering in their walk with the Lord are healed, while those who have a profound walk with God remain in a state of illness as illustrated by the various ways Jesus healed the hurting in his ministry, God won't be boxed in by any preacher or program, by any man or method. Therefore, the manner and the timetable of healing remain a mystery. Of this, however, we can be sure about. By his stripes, we are healed indeed whether that be on earth presently or in heaven ultimately. Well, now here in this passage, this simple command that he gave them demanded action. And it meant that by the time they reached the priests, they'd be healed of their leprosy. Now the reason he wanted them to go to the priests was because they were the officials designated to pronounce them clean and they were the ones who would allow them to come back and rejoin society. So when they heard this command, they obeyed the word of the Lord and began to make their way to the priests. And sure enough, Dr. Luke confirms that while they were on their way to the priests, they were miraculously cleansed from their disease. Well, verses 15 and 16 tells us that something interesting happened. Verse 15 says that after they'd been healed, one of the men returned to thank Jesus. But instead of doing it privately, instead of walking up to Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, can I talk to you alone for just a minute? When he saw him again, he shouted with a loud voice and gave glory to God so that everybody could hear. And he did that because he realized that what Jesus had done for him came directly from God. Then, to honor the Lord for what he had done, the man fell face down at his healer's feet to say thank you. Luke then noted that not only was this person an unclean leper, 
but he was also an unclean Samaritan as well. Now, it would have been logical for him to have followed the other men to the temple to offer sacrifices after being declared clean. But he first came to the Lord Jesus with his sacrifice of praise. Now, this must have absolutely pleased the Lord more than all the sacrifices the other nine had offered, even though they were obeying the law. But by doing what he did, the Samaritan himself became a priest by building his altar at the feet of Jesus. Well, the Lord responded to his display of thankfulness by asking, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Did any return to give glory to God except for this foreigner? Now, it should be noted that when he used the word foreigner here, it wasn't out of scorn or out of contempt, but rather he used it to bring to the attention to everyone in the village and especially to his disciples who this man was. You see, by identifying him as a foreigner, Jesus was showing the greatness of one foreign man's faith in comparison to the mediocre faith of many of the Jews, especially of the religious kind. And furthermore, by coming to Jesus, the man receives something a lot greater than just physical healing. He was also saved from his sins. Now, when Jesus told him, your faith has saved you, those were the same exact words that he said to the unrepentant woman who anointed his feet back in Luke chapter 7. So all those, the Samaritans, nine friends, may have been declared clean by a priest. He was declared saved by the Son of God. Now, I think many of you would agree that it is. It's absolutely wonderful to experience the miracle of physical healing. But I think many more of you would also agree that it's even more wonderful to experience the miracle of eternal salvation. The principle here is that even those in low religious standing, as the Samaritans were, were able to acknowledge and believe in Jesus. But sadly, the religious leaders of Israel, who should have been the most sympathetic to Jesus and his teaching, were unwilling to embrace him. So what this story ought to show us is that if we consider ourselves a child of God, if you consider yourself a child of God, we should cultivate the grace of gratitude. You see, when we cultivate that attitude, when we cultivate a heart of thankfulness, it not only opens the heart to further blessings, but having a heart of thankfulness glorifies and pleases the Father. However, an unthankful heart is fertile soil for all kinds of sins. And Paul tells us about this in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. And there it says, and there he writes, For though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Now, I really believe that all of us can find a reason for gratitude before God. Matthew Henry, the famous Bible commentary, was robbed of his wallet once. He wrote in his diary that night, all the things that he was thankful about. First, that he had never been robbed before. Second, that though they took his wallet, they didn't take his life. Third, because even though they took it all, it wasn't very much. And finally, because he was the one that was robbed and not the one who did the robbing. Now, maybe being robbed or being mugged doesn't apply to you, and 
it's not really something that you can be thankful for. But I'm sure that if you sat down and you really thought about it, I'm certain that you'll find something to thank him for. Now think about it. You ought to be thankful that he's given you life. Maybe another reason to thank him is because of your parents or your children or your spouse. And as I said, there's just so many things out there that I'm sure that you can be thankful for. But the question is, are you doing that? Are you coming to him on a regular basis to thank him for those things? Well, he wants to hear from you. He wants you to come to him and to thank him for your blessings, for what he's given you, and even for the things he hasn't given you. You can begin to cultivate that grace of gratitude or that heart of thankfulness by just closing your eyes and just saying, thank you, Jesus. And then being specific about what you're thankful for. Now, another thing this passage also shows us is that being dedicated to following the Lord may require you to cross uncomfortable boundaries. For many of you, this will mean having to overcome every kind of prejudices you have towards others in order to accomplish God's work and to spread his message. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter proclaimed, God doesn't show favoritism, but in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. For many Christians, they feel a lot more comfortable staying in their bubble, remaining in their box, staying in their lane and not deviating from it. The reason being is that they know everybody. They, they feel comfortable with those they interact with. But see, what Jesus shows us here is that it's okay to step outside of that bubble, to step outside of that box, to cross over to the other lane and minister to those that are maybe outside of your denominational tribe or maybe outside of your church. There's so many Christians out there that need to be ministered to. And I think for many of you, God is calling you to do that, to minister to them. Maybe you know about that Lutheran that's down the street that just lost his job and needs just a little bit of financial assistance. Or that Baptist brother or sister that you work with that just went through a really difficult divorce. Or perhaps the Lord is calling you to minister to that Seventh-day Adventist friend of yours that you've known for many years because he's struggling with a secret sin. Understand again that the Lord wants to use you in so many various ways and to so many people. So it's okay to step outside of your box and use the gifts that God has given you to minister to other brothers and sisters that don't necessarily go to your church. Well, moving on, in the next passage that we're about to read, the focus shifts again from the disciples to the Pharisees. So if you still have your Bibles with you, let's go back to Luke chapter 17 and read from verse 20 all the way to the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, See here or there. For you see, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he told the disciples, The days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. They will say to you, See there, or see there. Don't follow or run after them. For as the lightning flashes from horizon to horizon and lights up, to the, lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. 
but first it is necessary that he suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as, it, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, and giving into marriage until the day of Noah, until the day Noah boarded the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It will be the same as it was in the days of Lot. People went on eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, and building. But on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a man on the housetop whose belongings are in the house must not come down to get them. Likewise, the man who is in the field must not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on, the night, on that night, two will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? They asked him. He said to them, Where the corpse is, there's also where the corpse is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Now, the main idea behind this passage is that faith will endure through the normal ups and downs of life because of the hopeful expectation of seeing the glorious moment when Christ comes or when Christ returns to earth. So let's in this idea a little bit more carefully by breaking down these 17 verses. First of all, it's really hard to know whether the Pharisees were sincere when they asked Jesus when the kingdom of when the kingdom would come or if they were just mocking him. But what we do know is that but what we do know is that as Jews, they definitely entertained hopes of a kingdom which would be ushered in with great power and glory. You see, they knew all the apocalyptic expectations raised by the Jews as the Roman oppression grew. The problem they had, however, was that they weren't as convinced because they saw those prophetic words as relevant to the past and not for that day. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I might have heard that before from a lot of people, that the Bible is relevant for the past, but not for the day. Well, these Jews, these religious leaders, these Pharisees, the only way they'd be convinced they were wrong was if they saw outward signs of great political upheavals. That's, for them, that was what they were looking for. But as usual, Jesus confounded them because his answer didn't really cast doubt on the fact of the coming of the kingdom. Nevertheless, his answer did correct two popular notions that I just mentioned. First, the kingdom was not coming in such a way that it could be seen with observable signs. The word translated observation or observable is only used here in the New Testament. And it means in classical Greek to observe the future by signs. And it carries the idea of, of spying, lying in wait, and even scientific investigation. So the point Jesus was making here was that God's kingdom wouldn't be a visible, earthly, temporal kingdom that people could point out as being here or there. Second, the kingdom wouldn't come exactly the way men expected it would. The Lord told them, For you see, the kingdom of God is in your midst. 
What he was saying here is that the kingdom of God was present in a different way than what they thought. It's present wherever Jesus is present. Signs such as the healing of the lepers were just proof of this fact. But sadly, the Pharisees had no desire to receive him or to know him. And so for them, even though the kingdom of God was in their midst, it was either purposely ignored or it just completely went unnoticed by them. Well, the question and answer about the kingdom led Jesus to speak more in detail about it to his disciples. So he instructed them about the kingdom in four areas. First, as to the timing of the coming of the kingdom, he tells them that there will be a longing for the days of the Son of Man, as well as false sightings of the Son of Man. See, Jesus needed to make sure that his disciples understood what he was teaching. And one way of doing that was by preparing them for the long wait. He explained that one day, they would want to see the kingdom. They would want to see the Son of Man, Jesus himself, to return to earth. They'd be so desperate and miserable that their only hope would lay in the immediate return of Christ. But even in that condition, even in their misery, Jesus' word was, wait a little longer. As they waited, though, he warned them not to be tempted to follow false prophets. He explained that these fake experts would try to use past and present events as visible signs that the kingdom of God was here or there. So to keep them from being misled, he gave them a warning that was just very simple. Ignore them. Don't follow or run after them. The fact is this. There won't be any confusion or guesses when he returns. Why? Because it'll be as evident as a lightning that flashes across the night sky or across the horizon. In his day, when the Lord returns, it'll be clearly visible to everyone. However, he does tell them about one sign they can count on. Before the Son of Man returns with his kingdom, the Son of Man must leave. There, in verse 25, he said, First, it is necessary that he suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. This was his way of telling the disciples that they must give Jesus up before they can receive him back. The second thing Jesus instructed them about was what the earthly conditions will be when the kingdom comes. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man, meaning that life will proceed as normal, even in a mundane way, until a time of sudden and unexpected catastrophe. The Lord then described that prior to the flood, the people of Noah's day went on eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Now, <clears throat> Now, it's not that these normal, legitimate human activities were wrong. The problem was that evil was what motivated mankind to live for those things. As a result, once Noah and his family entered the ark, the flood came and destroyed the rest of the population. Similarly, when the Son of Man returns to earth, no one will suspect anything until it's too late. And those who rejected his offer for mercy 
will face judgment. Again, the Lord said that the days preceding his return will be the same as it was in the days of Lot. Now, by that time, civilization had seen some advancement. Mankind not only went on eating and drinking, but also went on buying, selling, planting, and building. Well, one day, Lot quietly left Sodom. And when he did, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Well, it will be like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Commercial and agricultural business will suddenly give way to God's judgment. And those who spent their lives seeking to gratify their own sinful pleasures will be destroyed. The third area that he instructed them in are found in verses 31 through 33. There Jesus taught them about the urgency related to the coming of the kingdom, that it's not a time to look back or to hesitate. In verse 31, Jesus said that on that day, any attachment to earthly things will imperil a man's life. If he's on the housetop, he shouldn't try to salvage any belongings from his house. If he's out in the field, he shouldn't turn back to his house. Well, why? Because the coming will be so quick that nobody will have an opportunity to go back for something they forgot. This is meant to show us that possessions mean nothing in the face of the kingdom. Only faith in Jesus determines your fate. The Lord then reminds them about Lot's wife. Although she was taken almost by force out of Sodom, her heart remained in the city. In other words, even though she was out of Sodom, Sodom was not out of her. So when she turned back to take one more look, God destroyed her by turning her into a pillar of salt. Jesus here was cautioning his followers to not look back at a perishing world ripe for judgment but to set their eyes on the deliverance God sets before them. This ought to remind us of what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Well, we're then given the bottom line in verse 33. Whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. The point here is that you cannot protect yourself from the coming judgment by finding security in this world or in the things of this world. If you try to do so, you will lose it by being destroyed like the evil people of Noah's day, the people of Sodom, and like Lot's wife. On the other hand, a commitment to Christ involves attachment only to spiritual and eternal realities. These provide the greatest security available. Let me read to you what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. There he writes, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is, of, but is from the world. And the world with his lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. Now, so far in this passage, Jesus has taught about the timing, the earthly conditions, and the urgency of the coming of the kingdom of God. Finally, in verses 34 to 37, Jesus revealed that the purpose of the coming of the kingdom would be judgment. He begins this lesson by first illustrating what it will be like when Jesus comes for his people at the rapture. Now, if you want to read more about that, you can find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. But when this event occurs, it'll happen during the normal course of life and will be a time of separation. For instance, two will be sleeping in one bed. One will be taken away in judgment, the other a believer 
will be spared to enter Christ's kingdom. Similarly, two women will be grinding grain together. One, an unbeliever, will be taken away in the storm of God's wrath. The other, a child of God, will be spared to enjoy millennial blessings with Christ. Now, although a lot could be said about this verse, the main emphasis is on readiness, that Jesus will come suddenly at an unexpected moment. Now, past biblical examples show us that in times of God's great action, many people are left behind and a few are saved. Thus, at the rapture, some will be left on earth and others will be taken by Jesus. Now, let me also add that the reason I don't think this is speaking of the end of the seven-year tribulation is because believers who've had to endure that period have been given a time frame of when to expect Christ to return. And essentially, that'll be three and a half years from the moment the Antichrist proclaims himself as God in the new Jewish temple that will be rebuilt. But regardless of when the Lord Jesus returns to judge his enemies, there will still be separation of the saved and the lost. So whether it be by day or night, whether people are working or sleeping, the separation and judgment will come. Those who are saved will be left to enter the glorious kingdom, while those who are lost will be taken away in judgment. Now, before I cover verse 37, I want you to notice that, or you may have noticed that verse 36 is missing. Now, the reason for this is that it isn't found in the best Greek manuscripts. And thus, for the most part, it's not translated in most modern translations. Now, many believe that it was probably added by a scribe because of Matthew 24, 40. Here's the thing. It just simply continues with the agricultural metaphors of the context and, and makes sure men as well as, as well as women are included. Well, it appears that the disciples had as much trouble learning about the return of Jesus as the Pharisees did. See, whereas the Pharisees had wanted to know when this would happen, but had failed to see that it was already in their midst, even after Jesus had told them, the disciples wanted to know where this would happen. Now, the Lord could have just reminded them that he just said not to go out searching here or there for a place or it will be everywhere like lightning across the night sky. But he didn't. And instead, he gave them another illustration. Where the corpses, there also the vultures will be gathered. What he was saying with this was that you don't have to know the where, just as you don't have to know the when. It will be in plain sight. And it will be as natural and inevitable as vultures sensing the presence of an animal's corpse and gathering overhead to eat. The point being is just as you see the vultures from afar and know what they're up to, so you will see many of these things come to pass and realize that his return is nearing. How? The Holy Spirit will give you the insight to see it. And if you're not already seeing it, then you need to ask the Lord to open your eyes just a little bit wider. As I begin to conclude, I just want to quickly review these two passages we covered. In the first passage, we saw the importance of trusting God to do what He says. And when God does something wonderful to bless you, be grateful. Don't be like the nine lepers who were healed and left for the priest without saying thank you. Instead, imitate that foreigner, that Samaritan, who although he was among the least of the little ones, he had a grateful heart. In the second passage, we saw that once again, the Pharisees couldn't just keep out of Jesus' life and were always looking for a way to tempt him. This time, they wanted his take on the kingdom of God. However, he claimed they didn't have to look any further because where he is present, the kingdom is present. Yes, one day the kingdom will come in fullness, but only after the Son of Man has suffered betrayal, rejection, 
and crucifixion. He further explained that his return will come when you least expect it. But in the meantime, we shouldn't look for grand signs or for him to be in some kind of secret place. See, if you're, in a, see, if you're alive when he does come, you will know it. Just as you would know if you were in the midst of a violent lightning storm. We must keep in mind that God will bring judgment in the midst of daily life with no spectacular preliminaries. For example, just look at Noah and the flood, or Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Their everyday daily routine was interrupted by total destruction. So will it be in the return of the Son of Man to establish his eternal kingdom. Therefore, as born-again believers, we must be ready. We must be ready when it comes. We can begin doing this by placing our faith in God and not in the world or the things that are in it. And the last thing we saw was that the disciples essentially had the same kind of question the Pharisees had, but theirs was where? And Jesus replied to them with the same type of answer, you'll know. Just like the vultures find a dead corpse, you won't be able to miss it. The message for us here is to just be ready and have faith to the finish. So my question to you all is this. Are you looking for his return and are you ready? Do you have faith in Jesus, even the faith of the smallest seed imaginable? If you're not ready for his return and you want to be, you want to be ready for his return, then allow me to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, I want you to do this because you really believe in him. You really believe that he is the Savior. You really believe that he is God's son. You recognize, you recognize that you're a sinner and that you need salvation and that he died on the cross for your sins. Then I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, I want you to Close your eyes and bow your head. And yes, if you can, you can kneel down if you want to. But with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. I thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, we want to know all about it. Please contact us and we'll get in touch with you as soon as we can. This is a glorious day. Right now there is joy in heaven because a new person has come to saving faith. So let us know all about it. If you're here in El Paso, we want to invite you to come check us out here at Fresh Vision Church. We're a small church, but we're a church with a big heart. And you'll find a home here. So if you need information about the church, you can go to our website fvcelp.org. I hope that this message has blessed you, whether you're a new believer or a believer that's been walking for a while. And I hope that it's challenged you or that it's radically changed you. I'm going to continue to pray for you this upcoming week. I pray that you will be the salt and light out there in your homes, in your communities. So have a blessed week, and I look forward to having you join us again next week as we start to cover Luke chapter 18. I'll see you soon.